Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we look at verse 175, which reads as follows. Hangsa di japate yanti, akase yanti indhiya, niyanti dira lokamha, chetwa marang savahini. Which means, swans go by the path of the sun, the powerful go through the air. The wise go out from this world, niyanti dira lokamha. The wise go out from this world, having defeated Mara and his armies, together with his armies. So three different paths or ways of going. The story behind this is one of the very short stories in the Dhammapada. There's not much to it. The story goes that there were 30 monks who came to see the Buddha. And they came just as Ananda was going to see the Buddha. So Ananda saw that these monks were coming and he thought, okay, I'll, I'll wait and let them have a private audience with the Buddha and then I'll go. And I think Ananda was going to go wait on the Buddha, uh, help him bathe or provide him with whatever he needed. So, uh, well, I'll just wait. And he waited and waited, and they never came out, and so he went in after quite some time, and the monks were gone. They just disappeared. And the text explains what happened. They, well, they were there, well, Ananda was waiting. They listened to the Buddha teach what he call, they call Saraniya Dhamma which uh, is actually a specific dhamma, but some, something memorable. Saraniya is memorable. So I think it just means he taught them some memorable dhamma. Having listened to this, they became arahants. Having become arahants, become enlightened, they flew through the air out of the, the forest, I guess. Where was the Buddha? He was in, in the Jetavana, so he was in the forest. And these 30 monks, after hearing the Buddha's teaching and becoming enlightened, they flew out. So Ananda came in, didn't see them, and said, well, where did those monks go? What happened to those monks? Where are they? Kata, they've gone. By what, and the, he asks, Katarena Magina, by which path did they go, Bhante? Ananda, they went by the sky. And Ananda said, what, they became arahants already, that quickly? And he said, yeah, they, kinasava, he says, so having destroyed the taints. And he says, in my presence, having heard the Dhamma, they became arahants. And at that moment, it said that there were some swans flying through the air, and the Buddha said, Ananda, those who have well developed the four idipada. Idipada is the roads to power, the path to power. Fly through the air, go through the air like a swan. And then he taught this verse. So I guess there's a lot we could say about <clears throat> magical powers like flying through the air. I'd rather not talk too much about it. I've, I've sort of uh, fastidiously or dedicatedly avoided talking about the more magical parts. And I've, I have explained earlier in this series about how it's not really the point um, and it doesn't really matter if you don't believe in such things. I think a sort of a cop-out we have is that, oh, nowadays it's much less common near near unheard of to have someone gain magical powers being able to fly through the air but of course it's more important to note that it's not necessary and their two are are related in the sense that they both 
uh, and they both deal with the mind, but the path to become an arahant and the path to gain magical powers are quite divergent. And um, one is not necessary for the other. Now Ananda makes an interesting, his, his question is interesting because it almost sounds like he assumes that uh, if they gain magical powers they must have become arahants, which I think is a fair assumption because that is what the Buddha would have led them towards. I mean, I think what's more fantastical about this story is how quickly people could become enlightened in the presence of the Buddha. That's really a, an amazing thing and I think open to some skepticism people would think how is this possible? It takes me so long to even gain a little bit of insight and yet these people they just heard the Buddha speak. We don't know exactly what the Buddha taught these monks but we have this idea that the Buddha um, was very good at giving people exactly what they needed and people who had the great fortune to meet with the Buddha were uh, fortunate in such a way that they already had quite a good deal of development that those of us who are still stuck in samsara thousands of years later probably didn't have. So there's that as well. But there's a lot of interesting discussion about how it could be possible to, for example, fly through the air when physics appears to show that that's not possible. So I guess there's some sense that uh, the laws of physics are circumscribed or are limited and are um, separate from the realm of, of the mind and in fact manipulat manipulatable by the mind in ways that are not, it's not really possible to de detect within, with physical instruments, the mind being outside, like take for example how quantum physics works. I mean, first of all, the example that quantum physics really th threw a monkey wrench in the whole deterministic concept of, of reality, or at least the, the physical concept of reality, that we're not really sure anymore um, what reality is made of, or there's debate. There's more debate, because clearly it's not just billiard balls anymore, billiard balls of matter bouncing off of each other. But more than that, uh, it showed that apparently you can, I mean, one interpretation at any rate um, is that there is this dependency of physical reality on the mind or an interaction. Now, of course, it's hotly debated and a lot of people would deny that, but there is... Uh, there's a way of understanding it. Anyway, it's quite... The point being that reality is a lot less fixed or certain than we might think it is. And I don't want to dwell too much on this because I think there's, of course, much more important things. Uh, regardless of your appreciation for the ability to fly through the air, I think the most important point of this story is that the Buddha um, appears to, in a way, put Ananda remind Ananda of something or make clear to redirect the conversation. So Ananda associates flying through the air with enlightenment and the Buddha is fairly quick it seems to remind him or to make clear the point that it's those who have gained mental power, sort of this mental fortitude uh, which is useful for becoming enlightened, but not not sufficient. Uh, you might say it's necessary to become enlightened as well, but when directed in a certain way, the four idipada, which are your appreciation or your interest in something, uh, the effort you put out for the task, the focus, of mind that you put on the task and your reflection, your ability to uh, adjust and adapt and keep a wise look on a wise view of what you're doing. These four things are the roads to success, the roads to any power in any kind of activity. 
but particularly they relate to magical powers. They gain, they help you gain fortitude of mind. And the Buddha says, those who those who fly through the air have gained that that power of mind, indi power. But he reminds Ananda that the real path, the real going, is not whether you go through the air or go on land. Most important is the going out, niyanti. Yanti means they go. Niyanti is like nibbana. Niyanti, they go out from this world, lokamha. So the real lesson here is about the path. It's about the way. And and it relates to things like gaining magical powers because magical powers or fortitude of mind is one spiritual goal. You know, this great, even the great calm and tranquil states are desired and, and pursued by a great number of spiritual people in the, in the world. But the Buddha makes clear that this going, this, this path following, whatever it may be, whether it might be the ordinary way of going here or going there, becoming this, becoming that, or even the spiritual way of being able to fly through the air or read people's minds or remember your past lives. So many different magical powers that are claimed to be possible. But the real path is internal. It's about leaving the world which can never be done, no matter how fast you fly or no matter how fast you run. But it's done by, by inner, an inner movement, an inner travel, traveling from the defiled state to an undefiled state, traveling from impurity to purity, from darkness to light. Because it feels very much like we're traveling, like we're going a long way. You practice a lot of meditation, days, weeks, months, years, lifetimes. It really feels like you've taken a trip. If you think about who you were before you started practicing, you've come a long way, we would say. It is a real path. The Buddha described it as such. And he would chastise the monks if they were talking too much about external paths. He said, e seva mago natanyo. This is the path, the only path, not those other ones. There are no others. When you begin to practice mindfulness, your perception of the world changes. Rather than thinking about, oh, now I'm here, now I'm there, you realize that actually you're always here. Wherever you go, it's here. And this is because our ordinary activity, in, in a conceptual sense, is, is never here. It's always somewhere else, or thinking about conceptual places and things. But when you're mindful, you're truly here and now. You realize that before you only thought you were here, here or there. But now you can see where you really are because you're in tune with what's really happening in the present moment. So the, the question then is, well, what is this path? What is this path that we talk about being mindful and what is the way? And the Buddha provides, you know, we obviously give many answers, and this is a, this topic forms the core of a lot of what I teach and what the Buddha taught, what we teach in Buddhism. Uh, but in this verse, the Buddha offers an interesting uh, example or interesting description. Marang titwa marang sawahining, having conquered Mara. This is a way that we often talk about the path. Mara is the evil one. Mara means evil having conquered evil together with its armies.
And so Mara, when we talk about evil, I mean, it's, here it's, it's being imperson personified. And there is a sense that one type of Mara is actually a, 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 a heavenly or a, a super, supernatural being. Supernatural being uh, living in some high state of existence that has what they call the delight over the creation of others. So there are beings out there that delight in our creations. They're probably having a field day with all the things that humans have created. And so they, they are supposed to try and manipulate. They spend time manipulating humans to make them create more. And they're very much displeased by uh, people like the Buddha, who encourage people to stop being creative and to stop uh, chasing after things, right? Stop building up, really in a sense tearing down and, and building up internally something that they don't really delight in. And so the Buddha called them Mara, whether that's actually what they call themselves. He labeled these angels, these, these uh, heavenly creatures or ethereal beings, Mara. But the evil that we really talk about and the Buddha's really, I think, focusing on here is the evil of defilement. The Buddha talked about ten armies of Mara and so here he says Mara and his armies, or Mara and its armies. He's really talking about the well, the evil of defilement and also the evil of suffering. You know, there are many things in the world that create for us problems and cause us to be distracted and diverted and, and trapped in the world. So the first, of course, sensual pleasures. I'll go through the ten armies of Mara because I think that's quite useful. Sensual pleasure, this is an army of Mara. It gets us so trapped and caught up. Think about how much of our life is spent, how much of our energy is spent pursuing sensuality. How much of our economy and our activity as a human species is caught up in just trying to see beautiful things, hear beautiful sounds. Take what we call the music industry. It's a huge industry and how much money goes into it and time and energy. I walk, uh, to uni I walk around university and at least half of the students walking around have these earbuds in their ear now. It's such a thing where we're constantly trying to hear beautiful sounds. I mean, to, to really define it very simply, it's just trying to hear beautiful sounds. We put so much more into it and turn it into such a thing. What type of music you listen to and how the music calls to you and all, the, all these descriptions of it. Ultimately, the core of it, you know, there could be a message in certain singing and so on, but the core of it is our desire to hear something pleasant. Uh, smells, tastes, how much energy goes into food, how obsessed we are over good food. So, how much of our lives is caught up in flavors and feelings. So pleasant feelings, warm, cool. How obsessed we are with the cold. When it's cold, we complain. When it's hot, we complain. Uh, nice, pleasant touch of soft and hard and the feelings that come from sexual and sensual touch and that sort of thing. It's the first one. The second one is discontent. So these are armies and they're, they're sort of things that contribute to our defilement, to our, our impure state, to, to the state of mind, states of mind that cause us suffering. You know, we're not trying to be, um, it's not about sin or evil or so on, it's, it's particularly about things that hurt us. Discontent is a big one. You know, contentment, the Buddha said, is the greatest gain, and it's discontent that drives us. 
we can't sit still, we can't be alone, we can't be, we can't just be I'm caught up in so much discontent. Number three is hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst are not evil, uh, not impure, right? It's not an impure thing that you need water and food, but it's evil. It's an it's a ancillary evil in the sense that it drives us to so much, so much stress and diversion. If we weren't hungry and didn't get thirsty, how much we would how much we would save on our ambition and our drive to attain and obtain. Number four is craving. Of course, this is a big one really the root of it all, we want things. And it turns out that nothing we want can bring us happiness. And so it just brings us more and more wanting. Now, of course, the, the overcoming of all these things, this is the, the conquering all of these. This is the process is what we go through in meditation. especially craving, so we overcome craving by realizing that the things that we crave are not worth craving. There's no good in them. Number five, sloth and torpor. We're caught up by this unwieldiness of mind that comes from sleeping a lot, comes from living our life in laziness, keeps us from being awake, being alert, being alive. We are very much caught up in, and enslaved by laziness. Number six is fear. Of course, fear drives us to so much what we call it, what we might call evil. We might kill or steal or lie or cheat simply out of fear. It, uh, it prevents you from being at peace. Fear causes us to do irrational things. Doubt as well, number seven. Doubt is a big one, you might say. What's wrong with doubt? Doubt stops you from doing what is right. If you doubt something, it doesn't mean that just because you doubt it, it's wrong. It's very easy to doubt what is the right thing to do, what is good for you. And doubt can also cause us to do evil. We, we are unable to... Uh, unable to find the right answer, we're crippled by our doubts, and so we do the wrong thing. Number eight is conceit and, gra and ingratitude. It puts these together, which is curious. Conceit is uh, I guess in this sense not, not being able to appreciate others. So conceit here would be an over-appreciation, it would be a, a raising yourself up. But it, uh, in, re in relation to ingratitude, I think it means not being able to appreciate others. So ingratitude is not being able to appreciate what others do for you. you appreciate the goodness of others. and uh, These are not the core evil, but they're, they're a cause for great evil. Because if you don't think about the good other people are, have done to you, very easy to then uh, become greedy and, and, and well, conceited. You know, you only think about yourself you only, and you become very much, it's very easy to then become attached to sensuality without realizing you know, the, the cause and the, the benefit that other people have given to you. Number nine is gain, renown, and honor that are falsely received. So again, it's not wrong to have gain, renown, or honor, but often we're, we receive them without being worthy of them. So someone might be uh, very much praised as a teacher, but it turns out that they're, they're corrupt. Uh, Someone might be praised as a meditator, but it turns out they're just sleeping all the time. <laughs> but uh, you know, gain, so someone, someone gain, renown, and honor, they can all be gained falsely. 
They can, you, you can cheat and manipulate others, steal and, and so on. But gain when it's not, when you didn't work for it. You know, if you work for it, there's an appreciation of it. When you meditate and you work for the peace and the happiness that you get from it, and then people appreciate you, well, that, there's not such a big problem there. It's not, not as likely to lead you to uh, become conceited about it. But when you gain things unwillingly, when people appreciate you, it's a problem for new monks nowadays because monks in 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 Asia anyway, because monks are have have been for a long time treated quite well by lay people. In, in some countries, in Thailand, it's it was like that especially. Uh, so new monks would often become quite. Uh, egotistical, especially Westerners who aren't used to it, and and uh, when 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 they, everyone's esteeming them, they get the sense, oh, I must be something special. And without, it's kind of subconscious, really. There's a story uh, we've been through the story of uh, Badia. Badia was a man who thought he was enlightened because he he was shipwrecked and he lost his clothes, and so he was naked and. Because he was naked, he found, tried to find something, and I think he found I don't know, a piece of bark or a piece of wood to cover up his, his private parts. And people saw him and thought, oh, this must be some kind of saint because he, he goes without clothes. And so at first he pretended, and he was like, yes, yes, and they brought him food, and he was like, oh, good. But eventually he started believing it, and he had this sense because of the, the gain that people were giving him. So it's a cause for... Uh, great distraction and delusion. It can mislead you just by the fact, you know, when we often look to other people for confirmation that we're doing the right thing, and if everyone's praising you, it's easy to start to think that you're on the right track, but it's quite possible that you're being wrongfully praised. And number ten is self-exaltation and disparaging others. So again, this is really related to conceit, but it's in the, the topic of how we relate to others, when we disparage others and hold ourselves up. This is a very bad habit, obviously. I mean, this is evil in itself. But it's a bad habit that leads to other defilement, or it becomes pernicious, right? Because even meditators can gain, the, can have this. You might say that all ten of these are things that meditators particularly have to deal with, or meditators still have to deal with, even though they might do away with some of the coarse ones. These are things that Mara tries to throw at meditators. Uh, so you begin to gain insight and clarity and, and peace of mind. And then you look at the people who don't meditate and you think, huh, I'm better than all those people, right? Quite pernicious and it can really distract you and get you off track. It's, it can be a real problem, especially for monks who are often held in a higher regard. Because they're held in a higher regard, they find it hard often to receive criticism. They think, who are you? I'm a monk. Meditators can have that as well, right? If as a meditator someone who doesn't meditate criticizes you, it's a very hard pill or bitter pill to swallow. Someone who's not meditating points out how unmindful you are. These are the ten armies of Mara. They're, you could say they're just part of the larger picture of defilement. That's a good list. So Mara himself really just refers to all of the stuff inside that is impure. And it's impure, and we consider it impure because it leads us to suffering. It's not so much what it does to other people, because they should be able to take care of themselves. They are responsible for their own happiness and suffering. But if you hurt other people, if you relate to other people in a clingy or... A stressful way, you're just going to create bad habits and you're going to create a, a sadness, a 
sense of low self-esteem or, or guilt, right? Guilt is the word. You feel guilty afterwards. You feel bad about it, and so it will cause you stress and suffering. And as well, if it has nothing, even if it has nothing to do with other people, if you just sit around desiring this or desiring that, or if you live your life craving this, craving that, chasing this, chasing that, you'll never be at peace. You'll always be wanting. You'll never be free from suffering. And so the practice of meditation is, this is the path. This is the way one gets out of the world. The world is all of the things that we create and get caught up in. When you stop being caught up, stop chasing after, you free yourself from the world, you go out of the world. You leave behind the world. That's the real teaching, I think, in this verse. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best.